Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, laying out for you another top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today we want to discuss 10 families of questions to ask about a Bible passage. To be most efficient when you go to grocery shopping, make a list. The same is true with Bible study. If you don't have a good set of questions, you might miss out on some of the best answers. You might already have a great list, but there may be something here to help you today. We've grouped them in 10 families of questions to give you a whole cartload of questions. So let's start with number one, heart issue questions. I think this is the place for everybody to start. Have I asked for the Spirit's help? Do I have my resources available? Am I willing to do whatever God teaches me today? Those are the heart questions and we need to begin by asking those. I think with that first family of questions where this idea of breaking up the fallow ground and getting ready for the seed of the word to be implanted on our heart and how important that is in preparation yeah. before the study. Beautiful illustration. Uh, we sure need that. So when we think about preparing our hearts for the word, we acknowledge that the word of God is practical. It's intended to change us and we need to start with that attitude. Our next family of questions are big picture questions. So we want to ask, first of all, what kind of literature is it? You don't read a love letter like you read a mortgage. So you shouldn't read the Psalms like you read Romans. So ask what kind of literature is it? Narrative, like a story? Is it poetry? Is it legal argument? Because that will give you a short list of what to look for in that kind of literature. And then secondly, do we know the author? Do we know who the recipients are? Do we know a little bit of the background of the story? So these are big picture ideas before we really get into the text itself. Next, divide and conquer questions. What does that mean? If you're teaching a child how to eat, after they've been past the baby food stage, eventually you get the tools in their hands and you teach them how to rightly divide things. They don't just put the whole thing in at once. And so while the Bible is one continuous book, it's divided not only into books, into a collection, a library of books, but each book has been thankfully divided into chapters and chapters into verses. Uh, sometimes, depending on your translation, the paragraphs are not so obvious. In some translations they are. But obviously we want to take off sizable pieces that we can handle and not take too much at a time. So we want to ask questions like, can I notice where the paragraphs or the subsections are in this chapter? And sometimes we have to ask, does an idea flow over from one chapter to another? Sometimes the chapter divisions don't really show us the paragraphs and we need to go back into the previous chapter. But we want to get a clear thought flow section where we're looking at a smaller chunk of scripture and not running on too big because otherwise it'll be like a child putting too big a piece of food in their mouth. It's not a good thing to think about. Next we have the main thought question. If you can read a chapter and come up with a five word praise, a five word caption or title of the chapter, you will have put your finger on the main idea. And that main idea then is going to be like the river into which all the tributaries run. So it's crucial that you get that main idea. And one way to come to that conclusion is by finding a title that fully describes the chapter. Next we have context questions. So we want to ask a verse context. How does this verse fit with the verses around it? 
And then, of course, it's possible to actually take a whole chapter out of context. That's what people do with 1 Corinthians 13. They think it's just a love song to read at weddings, where it's actually showing you how to function with your gift in the church. And some people actually take whole books out of context. They don't understand where the book fits. Some people confuse Israel and the church, and so they start looking for the church back in the Psalms. Or they confuse the law of God in the New Testament. So it's important for us to understand the immediate context and the general context if we're going to understand the meaning of the words. Next we have flashback questions. I think one of the really helpful things to see in the scripture is when we have a quotation from somewhere else in the Bible. And so when you have a phrase like when he says or as it is written, we're going to have to find out where that was written. And sometimes where it was written is quite surprising. We don't expect it written there. It seems to be taken out of a place that doesn't quite fit here. But of course the Holy Spirit gets to decide what verses he wants to use and reuse in the scripture. Then secondly, we also want to think about the way that the verse is translated because sometimes it's taken from the Masoretic, the Hebrew text. Sometimes it's actually quoted from the Septuagint or the Greek text and sometimes it's a free translation or a combination of these. And so sometimes we will read, for example, in Isaiah, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before a shears is done. But when Philip reads the obvious Septuagint, the Greek translation, those are flipped. He's led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before a shears is done. So we'll find this sorts of thing. A body have you prepared me is the New Testament translation to my ear you have digged, which goes back to the story of the Hebrew servant and how an awl was placed through his ear and essentially he was giving his body to the service of his master. And so that allusion is explained in a different way. So sometimes the quotations end up in a more beautiful or a more exciting or a more interesting way in the New Testament than we find them originally in the Old. So it's good to see the original context and then see the New Testament application. Number seven, other bridges between the old and the new. Questions like that. All right, so one of the ideas we have is allusions, not illusions, but right. allusions. An allusion is not necessarily a direct quotation, but clearly the author is referring to something in the Old Testament. So we have to ask questions like, is the phrase in James 1.25, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, is he actually giving an allusion to the laver? The laver was a special bowl that was made out of the hand mirrors of the women and it had the water in it. What a beautiful picture that is of the Word of God. So the Word of God is not simply a mirror that shows me the things that need to be cleaned up, but actually provides the solution. So I think that is a beautiful allusion. And then there are types or prototypes. In other words, God is building a case way back in the Old Testament for what he's going to do in the New Testament. So there are these patterns or these motifs that begin in the Old Testament, the idea of brides and bridegrooms, especially Jewish bridegrooms with Gentile brides like Joseph and like Boaz and Jacob and so on, Moses. Is he telling us something that is going to explode in the New Testament with our Jewish bridegroom and taking a Gentile bride? Or a sheep and shepherds going through until we come to John 10 and actually end up in Revelation where that's one of the big themes of the Lamb of God. So we're looking for those patterns, for those fulfilled prophecies, Prophecies in the old that come in the new. Questions in the old that are answered in the new. Where is the lamb? Right? That Isaac asks on Mount Moriah. The answer comes when John the Baptist says, Behold the lamb. There's the lamb of God, the one that God provided. So looking for those connections really enriches our Bible study. Number eight, the important word questions. 
Obviously, the Bible is constructed of words, and words have meaning. And sometimes we get a bit sloppy with the words of the Bible. I remember an old man preaching on, Oh God, my heart is fixed. And his conclusion was, My heart used to be broken, and now it's fixed. Well, the word fixed there means fixed as a beam fixed on a location. It's a focus of something. It's not a matter of it being broken and being fixed. And that would simply be a matter of getting out my Bible word dictionary and look up the meaning of the word. So Greek and Hebrew words are not always used in the same way that English words are used. And we have to have an English Greek or English Hebrew dictionary to explain that. But when I'm reading through a passage, I'm looking first of all for technical words. If you're going to learn to drive, David Gooding said, it's a great idea to know the difference between an accelerator and a brake. So in every area of study, in medicine, and pedagogy, whatever it is, people have technical words, and we have to learn what they mean. So it's important for us to know the difference between justification and sanctification, or we're going to be very confused when we read Paul's writings. So we need to know the technical words and what they mean, and then the repeated words. Why, when we come to the word believe and its various cognates, John uses it 99 times in his gospel. It's a big word to him. And there are many words that are often repeated throughout Scripture, and they give us like the tendons that hold the body of truth together, like a tapestry where a word or an idea appears, disappears for a while, shows up again, sometimes over against something different, a different idea, a different combination of ideas, and it's important for us to follow those threads through the Word of God. So we have technical words, we have repeated words, and then we have connecting words. Therefore, wherefore, but, and, and so, words like that that show us it's like the shifting of gears where we're talking about something but we change into something else or remember that looking back now therefore making an application so these are pivotal words in the passage and then we have key action words the verb words right verbs and their tenses we have something in the old testament called the prophetic past where god speaks about something in the future as if it's already accomplished because he dwells in the eternal now. So he says to Abraham, before Abraham has even a baby, I have made you the father of many nations. So these make for a fascinating study. We need to be careful with them. And just because a word can mean a lot of different things, you'll see in the back of a Strong's Concordance, this Greek word can mean all of these things. It doesn't mean all those things in any particular passage. For the same reason that when I use a word that can mean a number of different things in English, I don't mean all of those things at once. I mean one of them. So that's where context, understanding what God is saying, the thought flow in the passage, helps me to determine the meaning of that particular word. There are places where God expects me to provide the context. You have in James, count it all joy when you fall into diverse, and you have the word temptations. Some people change it to trials. But then later on, don't let anyone say he's tempted by God. Oh, so we say the one means trials that are not morally wrong, they're just difficulties, and the other is a moral wrong. But the fact is it's the same Greek word. But is it really the same Greek word? So again, our friend Dr. Gooding uses the illustration if he says, Aunt Mary made me a homemade cake for my birthday. Now, you don't know Aunt Mary, and you don't know what kind of a baker she is, but you assume from homemade that it's better than store-bought. But I, if I later in the conversation say that her husband, Uncle George, has a homemade car, <laughs> you don't think that's better than store-bought. Even though it's, quote, the same word, it's in a different context, and we're expected to apply the context when we read that word. So we need to be careful with the words, but we need to enjoy the richness and fullness of the wonderful words 
that make up the Word of God. Every Word of God is pure. And the words have been selected by the Spirit of God, not just the ideas. When Daniel finished his book, he put down his pen and said, I don't even know what I've written. So obviously the words were selected by the Holy Spirit. And we need to be careful with them when we're studying and be a diligent student of the words of Scripture. Number nine, the main purpose questions. Well, obviously, studying the Bible is not simply information transfer. It's intended for transformation. And one of the ways that we are transformed is by the careful application of what we're learning. So as I read through the Bible, we ask, what do I learn about God from this passage? Because this is the ultimate idea. It's not to know the Bible, it's to know the author. And we learn about the author in the book. And so what does it teach me about God? What does it teach me about Christ? What does it teach me about the Holy Spirit? Because a lot of people who call themselves Christians are strangers to God the Father. They're strangers to Christ. They only know of him as a historical figure or as an apologetic argument. These are real persons that want to be known and loved. And the end of our Bible study should always lead us to that in knowing God better, knowing his son, and knowing the spirit in a richer and fuller way. In the Bible study here, one thing that I found is helpful is sometimes it's hard to put out of your brain everything that you know from other passages. So to almost pretend what you are studying, that that's the only passage you've ever read. And then from there to say, what do I learn about God, uh, the individual persons of God from that one passage, has been helpful to say, imagine this is all you've ever had. And then it kind of allows you to see it in that right and to and to wring all the good out of that passage instead of just borrowing stuff that you already know it forces you to get all the good from it excellent excellent idea and number 10 application questions this is a great little list to have in the back of your bible so that when you're studying a passage you can pull it out and you'll have a bit of a guide you don't have to be slavish in following the order or even all the questions, but something to measure what you're learning by. Because if you don't ask the right questions, you don't get the right answers. And as far as application questions, we ask questions like this. Are there commands in this passage that I should obey? They're not opinions, they're commands. Are there promises to claim? Many people, they put the promises up on the on the wall like this one, but they don't live in the good of them. God wants us to live in the good of the promises. Are there truths to embrace, things I've never seen before in the Word of God that I can glorify Him, I can worship Him for? Are there questions to answer? Is God probing my heart, looking for answers to questions? Are there practical changes that are needed in my life as a result of what I've read? And maybe there are some things I ought to share with others. I can say, I've got a friend going through some difficulty. Lord, show me something from this passage that I can share with them. Because again, this idea, uh, Brother Peter Pell used to say that you ought to give things away five times, and if you do, you'll have them forever. Keep them to yourself, they'll evaporate. You'll lose them. So find ways to share what you've learned with others, and it will solidify it in your own heart and mind.